Today's reading is from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 12 through 28. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span, and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? With whom did he take counsel and who instructed him? and taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket and are counted as the small dust on the scales. Look, he lifts up the isles as a very little thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor its beasts sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted by him less than nothing and worthless. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likens will you compare to him? The workman molds an image. The goldsmith spreads, overspreads it with gold, and the silversmith casts silver chains. Whoever is too improp- impoverished for such a contribution chooses a tree that will not rot. He seeks for himself a skillful workman to prepare a carved image that will not totter. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundation of of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. Scarcely shall they be planted. Scarcely shall they be sown. Scarcely shall their stock take root in the earth. When he will also blow on them and they will wither and the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. To whom then will you liken me or to whom will I, shall I equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things. By the greatness of his might, he calls them by name. By the, why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by God. How have you not known? How have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You know, I have a little calendar, you know, that you flip uh, every day on my desk. October 7th, it says, a little story about a little girl at the church. A little girl became restless as the preacher's sermon dragged on and on. (laughs) You all do. You are guilty of this, aren't you? (laughs) So finally, she leaned over to her mother and whispered, Mommy. If we give him money now, will he let us go? (laughs) I will not let you go until you give the money this morning. (laughs) Anyway, a little joke like that helps us. I want you to grab a pen or pencil, if you will. Or if you have a good memory, you don't need a pen or pencil. Just keep it in your uh, mind. I'm going to ask you to describe God using adjective. The sentence begins, God is dot, dot, dot. It's an open statement. What would you fill in the blank? God is using adjective. So we know that God is love and all this. Those are the nouns, okay? Change into adjectives. Just choose one, there are many. But in your understanding, God is dot, dot, dot. Okay, keep that 
in your mind or write down on your paper. We'll come back to that. This morning we are going to think about one of God's attributes, the greatness of our Heavenly Father. May the Lord open our hearts to see how majestic He is so that we may worship Him at all times. You cannot separate the worship from the majesty of God. My sermon title this morning is The Majesty of God, and let me tell you what I mean by uh, the word majesty. It could be many different ways. Majesty, Oxford Dictionaries defines, I quote, impressive stateliness, dignity, or beauty. The word majesty is rooted in Latin, and it means greatness or grandeur. So you got the idea. In the world, we use majesty for kings and queens. We call them your majesty, her majesty, the queen, his majesty, the king, and so forth. When it occurs in the Bible, however, it always refers to the greatness of the Lord, our God, in the context of worship. Now, you could forget the rest of my sermon, but please take this away with you. The word majesty always refers to the greatness of the Lord our God in the context of worship. Professor J.I. Pecker says, I quote, the majesty applied to God is a declaration of his greatness, an invitation to worship. There are plenty of examples of you know, such references in the Bible, but I'm going to quote a couple of them. First one is Psalm 48, 1. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. Because of God's greatness, we are called to worship as well. Here's the second one, Psalm 95. For the Lord is a great God, and great King above all gods, in whose hand are the depth of the earth, the peaks of the mountains are also his, the sea is his, for it was he who made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down, let's kneel before the Lord our Maker. You see the connection between the majesty and the worship of our Maker. Although you and I worship the Lord every Sunday, many a Christian today still lack the knowledge of such majestic God. Think about it. Today's world is full of liberalism that glorifies human experiences. Everything related to our human, nothing wrong, but it just went too far. Everything focuses on human experiences. Technology further advances such liberalism. For example, we conquered the nature. We can manipulate weather. We almost defeated the disease and famine. We can even modify genetics. We order babies based upon our genetic preferences. How about blonde hair and brown eyes and brown skin, etc.? All for sale, folks. Welcome to the 21st century. We are the masters. We crown ourselves with a crown of wisdom, glory, and might. In our own eyes, we are truly mighty and great, are we not? We make ourselves little gods. So in this picture, where do you see the capital G, God? It's deja vu all over of the Tower of Babel, if you think of it. Remember that many, many years ago, people said, come, let's build ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven and let's make a name for ourselves. They say we could reach up to the heaven and let's make a name for who? Ourselves. Remember the Garden of Eden, the serpent approached Eve and tempted her? What was the catch? You shall become like God. 
Since the beginning of creation, we humans never stop trying to be like God. When the self grows bigger and bigger, in turn, God becomes smaller and smaller. The greater humans become, the lesser God becomes. And you talk to any fellow believer in the church today using the word God. How often do you think we would get the impression out of the conversation related to God, impression of divine majesty, the greatness of God's power and might. Not often. By the way, remember, at the very beginning I asked you to describe God, your understanding, just for our informal survey here. Just I want you to look around, okay, how it is like. How many of you wrote God is loving? Just look around, okay? How many of you wrote down God is kind? Of some sort. Patient. How many of you wrote down gracious? All right. Okay. How many of you wrote down God is great? Those people are cheated our sermon topic today. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Do you see that? Majority of us think God as kind and patient. I'm getting to that now. Here's the thing. We tend to put God in the box, in the box of our limited understanding, and make him a puny God. Sometimes and other times we get a misrepresentation of God from the church. For instance, at church, we are taught and told and preached that God is personal, nothing wrong. He is kind, gentle, merciful, loving, and forgiving, and patient. So far, so good, folks. However, focusing only on such divine attributes, we totally lose the sight of God's majesty and his dominion over all the heavens and the earth. Personal God is great, and that's good. However, let's not forget the same God is almighty. It's like staring at a tree and believing that that's all there to it while forgetting the whole picture of the forest. Let's not forget the bigger picture. So here's the question for all of us. How do we then restore and return to the right understanding of God's majesty and his greatness? We must remove from our thoughts of God the limits that would make him small. Professor Packer suggests in the following two ways. Consider and compare. Consider Psalm 139. For example, where we see that no one can escape from the presence of God. I'm going to read to you verses 5 through 12. This is Psalmist praying to the Lord. You have encircled me behind and in front and placed your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot comprehend it. Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take up the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand will take hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me, and the light around me will be night, even darkness is not dark to you, and the night is as bright as the day. No one can escape from the presence of God. Next, God knows everything about you. Listen again, Psalm 139, verses 1 through 4. Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I get up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, Lord, you know it all. 
Nothing can we hide from him. His eyes are always upon us, and he's the all-seeing God, and his wisdom and presence and power are unlimited. All-knowing, all-present, and all-powerful is our God. The second way to restore the understanding of the majestic God is to compare him with powers and forces which we consider great. You bring all the powers and you know, forces you believe the mightiest and compare them to the Lord. God declares about himself in today's text, to whom then will you liken me? Or to whom shall I be equal? The Lord our God is the incomparable one. No equal to him, no match to him. In the following ways, first of all, consider the tasks, the works that he had done. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Measured heaven with a span and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure. Weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Was it not my hand that made all these things? Consider nations. To God, they are like a drop in a bucket or less than nothing. Behold, the nations, the Lord says, are just as a drop in a bucket and are counted as the small dust on the scales. Have you ever used the scales? Drop a small dust. Wouldn't count much. That's how God considers the nations. Look, he lifts up the isles as a very little thing. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted by him less than nothing. You don't have to be a mathematician. What's that mean? Nothing I know. It's zero. What is less than nothing? You say minus, negative number. The rulers are nothing to him. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. The Lord rules over the world. He sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. I hope your mind is expanding now to see how majestic our God is, folks. Consider stars in the universe too. We know that there are billions of stars and planets and galaxies, whatever. Keep that in your mind as you listen. Stand alone on a clear night, look up to the sky and look at the stars above. I hope all of you have experience like that. I had once driving through Nova Scotia. I was filled with awe when I looked at the sky. This is what God says about himself. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name. Did you hear what God says? He calls every single one of the stars by name. Do you think scientists numbered all these billions of stars and planets? but God already did. Listen, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. That's how majestic and powerful our God is. You know, I want you to, I actually challenge those folks who don't believe in the creation you still go to the church and you don't believe in creation. The challenge before you is this. You have the Bible. Clearly God states that it is I, it is my hand who created all these things. And you say that I don't believe it. The challenge before you is that do you believe what God says in the Bible? True and truth. Do you say, no, I believe not in the God who created creation, all these things. You make up your mind. In my humble opinion, if you do not believe in the creation, 
It is God who created. You truly cannot worship. Remember, God's majesty cannot be separated from the worship. Anyway, here's our response to his majesty. We repent of our sin that made him too small, too petty, too human, and too much like us. He is the Lord and we are his servants. We repent of our arrogance that we embrace the wrong beliefs about ourselves. We are not equal to God. We are not gods. God is and he's the creator and we are the creatures. Let us bow down before him. And finally, we repent of our slowness to believe how majestic our God is. Let us stand in awe before him. As for closing, I'm going to repeat what the Bible says again. God declares about himself, his majesty. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth. Let us come and worship our majesty. Let's bow as in prayer.